One of my favourite documents in the Haley Papers at the Fitzwilliam Museum is the last ever letter that William Haley wrote to William Cooper. It's dated the 1st of February 1800 and it was sent after Haley received a letter from Cooper's nephew and carer John Johnson enclosing a new translation in Cooper's hand of a couple of uh, verses from the Iliad. I particularly like the letter because of the conclusion to the sonnet that Haley includes. Ecstatic tears I on the paper shed that speaks, my Cooper, of thy mental health and of thy friendship, soothing as the dove. So weeps the nymph, who, when long storms are fled, welcomes from sea her bosom's rescued wealth to life, to joy, to glory and to love. There are two reasons that that fascinates me. It so closely mirrors the final stanza of Cooper's last poem, The Castaway, but gives it a happy ending. Which is weird because as far as anybody knows, Haley didn't read The Castaway for another year. And there is a smudge on the sonnet where he says, ecstatic tears I on paper shed. And I just have this image of him going, in 1796, Haley engaged the naval architect Samuel Bunce to design his Feltham turret. Being Haley, he asked him for additional favours as well. In October 1797, he wrote to Bunce asking him to help source a wheelchair for his son Tom, who was slowly and painfully dying from what Haley had recently diagnosed as Pott's disease, in other words, tuberculosis of the spine. By this time, Tom had lost the use of his legs and Haley wanted a wheelchair that he could both operate independently and use in the garden. Knowing that the inventor John Joseph Merlin had a chair that sounded suitable, Haley asked Bunce to go and check it out. After showing Bunce round and keeping him talking for absolutely ages, Merlin told him that his wheelchair would be no use whatsoever for the garden. It was too good and could only be used in a drawing room. Bunce found another almost identical to the one that Merlin had. It was all red leather, mahogany and brass nails and retailed for 17 guineas. Merlin's one sold for 17 and a half. The maker said he could make a plainer one for 15 guineas. He also intimated that it would take quite a long time. So Bunce asked his colleague, the naval machinist Samuel Ray, to build the chair. He specified that the wheels should be a foot in diameter and two inches thick. The ones on the chairs that he'd seen, he felt, were too small to be of any use in the garden. And he hopes the wheelchair will be ready in just over a week. The next we hear of it is in a letter that Haley reproduces in his memoirs of Thomas Alfonso from early November when he's in London um, and the chair has already been sent down to Chichester. Haley and Bunce are not very happy about this because they wanted to check it over just in case there are any improvements that needed making. There's evidence that Tom is genuinely grateful for the wheelchair because it does restore to him some of the independence that he has lost. There's only one small problem. The footboard is so near the ground that every time it encounters an obstacle, the whole thing stops dead. Tom wonders if they can remove the footboard, attach it back on with hinges, and using maybe one, two, or three small wheels, enable it to travel over bumps in the ground. Bunce recommends that Tom tests the chair outside before they make any alterations, but it's November and it's wet and so that doesn't happen. At this point, Tom was living in the turret, but he told his father that what he really wanted to do was move back to Eartham. That happened on the 3rd of January. That night, to amuse Tom and take his mind off his pain and the spasms in his legs, Haley started reading to him from his long suspended essay on sculpture dedicated to John Flaxman. Tom had, of course, been Flaxman's apprentice. Haley tells us that Tom urged him to complete the work. When I began the poem, I intended that it should comprise a sketch of modern as well as ancient art, but my attention has been turned from Donatello, Ghiberti and their successors to the dearer, juvenile artist. I have now watched, you know, considerably more than two years over this interesting invalid. I have seen him enduring a horrible series and variety of increasing tortures. In a part of this long and distressing period, I have resumed, at his affectionate request, my suspended work, and advanced in it by such troubled industry as those only can perfectly conceive who have forced the mind to labour with motives of similar affection and with similar disquietude. 
This introductory letter was written on the 19th of April, 1800. Tom died on the 2nd of May, exactly a week after William Cooper. Haley was, of course, devastated. And I think this is one of the things that often isn't taken into account when people talk about his relationship with Blake. Blake moved down to Feltham a couple of short months after Haley lost the two people he loved the most. We know that Haley did not appreciate Blake's poetry, his visual art, or the innovative ways in which he blended the two. Had Blake moved down at another time, this might have been different. It's entirely possible that grief had reduced Haley's capacity for appreciation. Full stop. In one of his more astute and less patronising comments, Haley's biographer Mortchard Bishop describes his subject as a past master in the art of suppression. He means that Haley, while he never actively lies, often leaves things out. He leaves people out too. Perhaps the most important of these is Tom's mother, Mary Cockerell. So while Haley tells us a great deal about his own grief at Tom's death, he tells us absolutely nothing about Mary's. But while we learn nothing from Haley's published writings, as ever with Mary, it's all in his letters. On the 7th of May, five days after Tom had died, Haley wrote to his friend Samuel Rose from Eartham. I came hither early this morning to scatter a few of my sweet Feltham primroses over the dear, livid frame of my lost child. His poor mother never quits the corpse, but she is much calmer than I expected and rational enough not to think of attending it to the grave. I hope to soothe her sorrow by indulging it as far as it can be proper to do so. She has discharged her most severe maternal duties so sublimely that all indulgence is due to her present misery. Just under a week later, the poor mourner at Eartham is too much petrified to admit of any social comfort, and I have requested her good mother to watch over her in her present calamitous condition. In an undated letter, he describes her as nearly petrified with grief as the human frame can be, and he adds that I hope by degrees we shall tranquillise her mind, but her loss must probably shorten her life. A mother could not lose more, nor feel that loss more intensely. One final thing to add, we can't assume that Mary's left out of Haley's published work because he wants to protect his own image. It's just as likely that Mary told him not to write about her. Her extant letters show someone unafraid of expressing her own opinions. I love this letter that she wrote to Haley, probably in 1796. It's this most fantastic critique of Romney's friendship pictures. I am glad you found the dear Pittore in a working tune, a proof that his nerves are equal to the season. I wish he may have improved the picture, for I don't think it well. Your fizz and hand is both bad, and Tom's finger up to his lip and more with a diminutive goddess. The whole must, I fear, be bordering on insignificance. He has sadly failed, in my humble opinion, in what he meant to excel. There wants that simple majesty in both the pictures of friendship. Thank you so much for listening.